Good evening, folks. Hi, welcome to one to one GWS and one to one insights webinar. We are very happy to have uh, Mr. Thomas Hodden, managing director at Tricentis, who will be taking us through his views and his experience on test automation. He will be covering on model based test automation and I'll be talking about um, his talk very soon. Before I invite him, I'll just take you through uh, 1.21. So 1.21 gigawatts as a company, we organize meetups worldwide, serving as community platform for industry collaboration. The name of the company 1.21 gigawatts is derived from the movie Back to the Future, where in the movie it was shown that you need 1.21 gigawatts of energy to go to the future. So this is what uh, we derive the inspiration from, where we share the knowledge which is needed to work in the future for the future and for our clients. We provide a platform to build and enhance the productivity quotient of working professionals. So agile testing, test automation, uh, these are some of our brands which we, you know, where we focus on globally and uh, we have close to 20,000 uh, subscribers from the testing community worldwide and uh, about 5,000 subscribers uh, from the testing community from ANZ region. We have been organizing conferences since last couple of years and uh, we have focused a lot from this year onwards. Our vision is to transform thoughts to accelerate success. 1.21 gigawatts have created a platform where the industry leaders collaborate with, the with, with various stakeholders of the industry. We have guest lectures where the industry leaders go to a company or a university and share their knowledge. We organize conferences, trainings, webinars like this one. We organize contests and also corporate awards. Please do visit our conference website 1.21gws.com slash events where we where you can find a lot of knowledge about software testing and also you can see some of our forthcoming conferences on testing and test automation we have the event in dublin on 21st of september in brussels in october in bangalore on 30th of november then we have in america in boston chicago and denver in first week of december so these are the, you know, some of the events we have planned over the next four months. Apart from testing, we also have another brand process automation where we have, we do plethora of trainings, especially online trainings on different technologies like UiPath, Blue Prism, Automate Anywhere, etc. Now, what do you get? All of you who have joined uh, this webinar, they get 25% discount on the published price access to the video recording of this webinar. You can download the top, 20, top 10 uh, uh, on software testing and test automation free of cost. And there are a lot of other things which you can do. So that would introduce Thomas had on here. I request the guests to put themselves on mute. Uh, you can also coming from there. Thank you. Thanks, Santosh. Uh, request everyone to put yourself on mute. And if you have any questions, you can share your question in the chat support. Now I invite Thomas to take this from here and share his talk on model-based model -based test automation. Over to you, Thomas. Welcome everyone to this um, webinar about model-based test automation. Um, I have the pleasure to spend the next 45 to 60 minutes with you and, and what I would like to get across is actually our experience of, of having worked with different test automation frameworks, what are their uh, advantages and disadvantages and in our opinion, what does really work in an agile 
context. And um, this is kind of the, the goal of this session. And if there, if there are any questions, I, I can't ask you to, to use the chat functionality um, in the WebEx session, and then we will go through the question at the end of the session. Let me start with the first, um, with actually with a story. And, um, and the story is about an, an Australian bank who has been on the forefront of, of agile software development and, and more so to become really fully DevOps, meaning today they run squad teams uh, that not only include the business and the developers, they also include the operational people. And they go through, um, they go through um, a sprint um, in two weeks, and, and as such, this is kind of their activity. And as part of their journey, um, which really started a couple of years back, back then they still had uh, a classical um, center of excellence for testing in place. The person there in charge asked the developers actually how long can it take them to provide feedback about a current build of their online banking system. And um, and back then they had um, uh, as part of their smoke test portfolio they had 500 test cases, and it took them a full week of effort to run a smoke test against their online banking system. And back to the question, the the, the dev team then responded uh, in the following way. They said. Actually, we have several builds a day, and we would like to have actually feedback within a coffee break. So they actually agreed to, to a coffee break of 12 minutes. And for the past couple of years, that bank in Australia is actually running a smoke test um, against a, a new build of their online banking system within 12 minutes. And, and what we are observing in the market is that when organizations move towards agile software development, they often aim for at least nightly builds. And when you have, or daily builds, one build a day. And if they aim for that, what you want to do is an overnight regression test so that you know when you come back in the morning that at least your old functionality um, still, still works. And in the bank's case, it took them three hours for a full um, regression test overnight, which they run once a day. And for, for the build during the day, they just run smoke tests. And often the, the time that it takes you to, to provide feedback is the main bottleneck of software development team. So if it takes you six weeks to, um, to, pro, to test the application, then your agility will never be faster than six weeks. So the question is now, what are actually the core ingredients to really um, have these fast feedback cycles. And as obvious, and this webinar is about test automation. So test automation is a very important part, and that uh, webinar will focus on that part. But it is not only it, – it is not only about – It is not only about, about test automation, and I want to put 
that out. When we talk about continuous testing, there are different aspects that will not be covered in, that, in, this, in this webinar that are probably equally important. I'm talking here about test portfolio design, trying to reduce the amount of test cases whilst maintaining a certain um, risk coverage. Um, we talk here about also exploratory testing, which is another important part of continuous testing, um, as well as, as a service virtualization, um, um, which, which is really required to eliminate any dependencies on third-party systems or satellite systems that you don't have uh, control over it and that would hinder you to actually run a test. And then also last but not least, uh, integration into the continuous integration uh, server who then executes these um, uh, tests on a, in an automated fashion and also reports back to the team. So that's just for completeness and this webinar is about the test automation bit itself. Now we as Tricentis, we also went through um, a similar transformation uh, process a few years back. And we at Tricentis, when we actually have our own, we have roughly over 200 developers, and we are a typical, you know, software technology vendor. And we have big screens when you come to our um, R&D um, um, office, which is located in, in the beautiful Vienna, um, in the country of Austria. And what you will find in there are actually big screens about um, if the the different um, uh, teams, Scrum teams, have achieved their, uh, their, their sprint goal. And what we did is actually in the sprint goal, we included in the definition of done um, that a full regression cycle or the application ha has to actually be tested, A, and B, also that um, the that all the test cases for progression testing um, is implemented in an automated fashion. Now, this is at Tricent is how it looks like when you have actually a UI heavy um, release. So when we have a new release of, of our product Tosca and we have a lot of UI changes, then this is how it looks over two weeks. The UI changes all the time, right? And only towards the end of the sprint cycle, we have a stable uh, user interface available. What that means for the team is actually that they can only start automating at the very end. So in that case, and, uh, and I just want to open up the bracket, this is our understanding and our experience, there is one exception when a team is allowed to complete the UI automation bit in the next sprint. This is when we have a very heavy UI uh, released, and usually the automation is built in the next um, in the next sprint. Now, um, for releases where we have very little UI changes, the requirement is clear: it need to be um, um, in the current sprint. The point that I want to take is. In order to achieve these very fast feedback cycles of 12 minutes, UI testing is, is only half the story. Uh, in the bank's case, they also shifted more towards API test automation um, in order to speed up test automation. And this is absolutely crucial when it comes down to supporting continuous testing because Based on our own experience in customer projects, it's four times faster in the creation of the assets. It has less maintenance with a factor of six, and it's also much, much faster in its execution. Now, obviously, we still need some UI tests, but we should focus on as many API tests as we can, and this is also what we, we do at Tricentis, developing our own product. Now, why do I tell you that? Because when we now talk about test automation, we have now two fundamental requirements towards our uh, test automation framework. And that is, firstly, it needs to support UI um, test automation as well as API test automation. So that's the first 
a very important aspect uh, according to a test automation framework. Now, what I would like to spend a few uh, a few minutes on is about uh, the various frameworks that exist on the market. I think any automation technology can be grouped into three distinct groups. And the first two groups is the first one, it would be a capture replay tool approach, and the second one would be a modern test automation framework. And the third one I will talk about, it's, it's model-based test automation. So when we look at the very, uh, at the linear framework like here, with linear framework, what I mean is pretty much a capture replay tool. Could be open source or could be a commercial tool where you just click the record button and what you end up is with a script. And what we will find in the script are two types of information. You will see actually the flow, the test data, as well as action if you enter something or validate something, but you also will find technical information. Um, how do you find a certain object or a window? So that's all mixed. And as you know, when you actually now want to, to, to start changing things and, and modularize it, um, then you start programming in the record replay approach and you end up with this spaghetti code like this one here. And and I think we, we all know that, that this approach will create as much work as it saves. So, I mean, that goes back quite a while, I would say 50, 20 years. And, and back then we actually came up with so-called test automation frameworks. And when it comes down to test automation framework, we at Tricentis, we asked ourselves, you know, what are the, the core aspect in terms of maintainability that are that is really relevant for um, for, for for test automation frameworks? And one aspect is the stability. So we talk here about the robustness of our test case in the first place. In particular, if you have changes to the UI or to the API that are not really relevant from a functional perspective, but you don't want that the, uh, the test case just, just fails because um, there was a little change from a technical perspective. Then modularity is a very important aspect regarding the reuse of certain aspects. Then the flexibility, this is really about, you know, probably, you know, can you, can you run API tests? Can you uh, run UI tests? Can you run against green screens and so on with the same framework? Readability is another very important aspect. In we all aim for for having the information presented in a business-like language so that the business people also understand what what we're testing here uh, from a coverage perspective. And last but not least, the maintainability. And every one of you who we um, have done test automation in the past. You know that maintainability is the number one killer when it comes uh, down to to the wide adoption of test automation. If you don't get that under control, it will create as much work as it takes. And what we now try to do is actually to 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 value and to estimate which uh, the different maturity levels of the frameworks that are on the market against these five. Um, uh, um, the criteria. So, on, on, I think the lowest maturity will have a record replay tools. Um, and the next one, and you see that on the top right hand side, uh, there is some text. When we now add, um, you know, synchronization to our script, synchronization means that you ensure that uh, the script that um, the script would not jump the gun in terms of clicking an object, although the object has not been loaded yet. That's what we understand about synchronization recovery. So let's assume you want to run 100 test cases overnight, but it stops after 10. So how do we make sure that uh, you still get the 90 of test cases that are outstanding run? So you want to have a recovery um, scenario in place that might even restart the application and then uh, start uh, with test case number 11. Um, and also object recognition, so really, really good. <clears throat> and this will certainly you know, help us, um, I think, with two main aspects, with the stability and the maintainability 
of, of our test and automated test cases. And the next level of, of test automation framework, what you then can do, and these test automation frameworks I'm really uh, referring to, it doesn't matter if that's open source or if that is a commercial a tool that is used as a driver, you build these capabilities on top of your framework. So then the next level is really about um, putting abstraction, structure, and encapsulation in place. And all of that is really mostly adding to the modularity, so the reuse of certain components. Um, the next level is then um, if you separate the test data from the core script and centralize the data because that will have a big impact about the maintainability um, as well as uh, to an extent about the modularity as, a, as, 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 as shown here. So this is a typical data-driven uh, data framework. And this is where I think a cost aspect usually kicks in. Um, it really works well for a single system. You can achieve very high automation levels with the traditional approach of using test automation framework. That's at least what I observe um, by talking to different clients. I, I see with almost any very modern test automation framework, high automation levels for single systems. Where it becomes more difficult is assume, as, uh, uh, as soon as you actually have end-to-end -end business process testing in place um, from a holistic perspective across all your 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 core applications. This is where you now would need to add a lot of software test engineers or developers who would further develop the automation framework in order to scale up. And, um, and this is at least what we are observing in the market. Um, I think the most modern uh, approach to to automation frameworks that, that exist today are probably so-called hybrid test automation frameworks um, that have a clear separation of concern in place between the business logic and the test automation logic. This is what I tried to highlight it here with this with, with the human sitting next to the code. Uh, when you now include um, a keyword, then you often will actually like, like a good application would be a, a BDD style approach to it, where you would actually um, maintain your your assets in a business uh, readable, readable language, like even when then, and then you would um, have the keywords um, generated. So these are the actually really the automation bit in keywords, and usually this is something that you would then program and also maintain in a programmatic fashion. And, um, and this is what you have seen now, I'll just do it again, and go one back that you'll see the animation. This really changes the readability. And also, I would argue also the maintainability because you have a clear separation of concern in place uh, between the business and the automation logic. Um, and, and I think this is uh, where we probably all agree that this um, also really works. Where it falls short is about the flexibility. Um, if we take, uh, for example, open source, it only works against um, web um, interfaces. But what we come across, in particular when you talk about the systems of record space, this is where uh, you also will probably find the most complex end-to-end -end business process tests, you will face a variety of technologies that um, are often required to automate, from interactions with the database through SQL queries to um, SAP. And when I talk about SAP, we often face SAP QE, the old user interface, but now we have also Fiori, the, 
the, the, the, the latest uh, interface from SAP, which is all web-based, but makes use of heavy composite controls, which is another topic that I come back to, but even native desktop application within .NET or Power Builder, or you name it, right? And this is kind of the flexibility that, that is really required of a modern test automation framework. And let me, let me summarize that now again. I mentioned initially that we, we can categorize any test automation framework in, in three distinct groups. And when I need to summarize that again, the record replay, remember what we will end up is a script that has business information and technical information as part of one script. And you record the script for every business scenario, so you have one to end script. And um, the real challenge here is, is maintainability, because every time if you have a business or a technical change, you will need to re-record, and as we all know, it will create as much work as it saves. So it's a very fragile approach. What we have done um, is, in order to address the fragility, is we came up with so-called test automation frameworks. And as you know, there are different maturity levels. I talked about um, you know, the modularization, about extracting test data, keywords, and very modern automation frameworks, um, what like a keyword-driven hybrid framework, what they really do well is to separate the business information, so the flow of, of the test data that you enter and the actions from the technical information. For example, how do you interact with the API or how do you find the right window with the right object on it? And, um, and, the, and I tried to actually visualize that with this uh, big bar that goes through it, this clear separation of concern, encapsulation and polymorphism. It really implements what we all know from object-oriented languages, what has been used and lived for many, many years. This is what is applied to test automation to make it more robust. Now, <clears throat> whilst that technically works, and as I mentioned, you can achieve very high automation levels, this is something that um, um, it does not scale, and that's our observation. That although having these test automation frameworks on the market for 15 years, every single organization that I talk to and I ask them, what is actually your automation coverage holistically ac across all your core applications, they all say it's somewhere between 15 to 25 percent. They have huge success in, for some applications, but holistically very little. And, and it has to do that these script-based um, test automation frameworks struggle to scale because it requires additional technical resources that further code that framework. Um, and usually these resources are very expensive and that's the reason why it doesn't scale. Now we at Tricentis, we thought, well, if we want to address the scalability, we need to remove the core restriction, in our opinion, that's the script itself. And what we came up with is with a model-based approach to test automation. And in model-based test automation, what we do in a nutshell is nothing else than we automate the automation framework. And you can use it in a BDD style with given when then or more in a traditional one, it doesn't matter. Um, um, it has a clear separation of concern in place, um, encapsulation and polymorphism, as we know, for a modern hybrid test automation framework. But the automation framework comes out of the box. And with that approach, it eliminates the need to code for these keywords that really come at the mouse click. And that's the real difference to model-based test automation. Now, when we talk about model-based test automation, what is actually the model? So let me quickly spend a few words about model-based test automation and, and also this, uh, make a distinction to MBT model-based testing, which is fundamentally different. So model-based test automation does the following. When you have a system on a test and we talk here about black box testing, then what you will find is that you have um, different interfaces. You know, usually you have desktop, desktop native application, you might have mobile interface, modern web application, you might have a green screen or you have even an API. These are the main interfaces 
that exists, either you know an API or a UI that allows you to access a black box um, uh, or a system from a black box perspective. Now, what model-based test automation does, it actually it scans these interfaces and it builds an interface catalog. And that interface catalog is um, stored and maintained in so-called automation models. The automation model has no information about your the intention of the test. It does not know about the flow, the test data, or do you enter or validate information. It only knows about how to interact with the system on the test. On the other hand, what we then maintain are test cases in plain English. It can be maintained in a BDD style with given when then, doesn't matter, or, or however, however you want to you know, name it. And that is decoupled um, from the technology. And only at the wrong time, uh, these information are connected to each other, and then it's executed. Because we have this clear separation of concern, you can now go for a bottom-up automation approach or a top-down automation approach. What do I mean by that? For example, um, if the system on a test is already uh, available, you can scan the application and you actually can automate from the beginning. But if your system on a test is not available, your UI is totally instable, so you don't want to make the effort of coming up with the automation models right now because you will need to change them all the time, you can actually start developing your test cases in plain English and execute in a manual way. In model-based test automation, at any point in time, you can execute a test case in a manual, in a semi-automated way or in, a or in an automated way. Now let's assume the application becomes available, so you then can scan the interface, build an automation model, and automate later. So it's really it, it really supports an incremental approach to developing your uh, automation assets. Model-based test automation, as I mentioned before, also allows you to execute the same asset in a manual way. Why? Because the clear separation of concern, as I outlined here, the decoupling, the like an object orientation, really allows you to separate these concerns and the test case looks exactly the same way before automation and after automation. There is no distinction. Now let me uh, make an example out of it. Let me, uh, on the left hand side, what you see is an application. Very simplified, it's a web application. It allows you to ensure a vehicle online. It's just a subset of it. You see you enter certain information of your car, and you then actually can click next. It's not shown here, but it will then display uh, what premium you would buy to insure your vehicle. If you have a capture replay uh, tool, then you probably would end up with a script on the right-hand side. If you use model-based test automation, what you will end up first is you scan this interface on the left-hand side, and you will come up with an interface catalog. The interface catalog on the vehicle data displayed here will include make, engine, year of construction, number of seats. This is my interface catalog. Again, the automation model has no information about what is the intent of that. It just knows how to find it. Now, let me just take a step back. In the traditional way where you would have a very modern hybrid test automation framework like in BDD style, and you have um, you would program these keywords so that it would look quite similar. You would have keywords like make engine perform year of construction. The difference is you would need to create them in a programmatic fashion, right? The developer needs to do that. At, with a model-based test automation, the idea is that this comes out you know, add a mouse click, you scan the interface, you select the component, it will create the, the, the automation model for you. Good. The next step is then we actually can use these automation models and uh, enrich a test case because the test case will now suddenly include a flow, it will also include test data, and it will also tell you do you need to enter information or validate information. So that's now the clear separation of concern that we see here as well. Now, once we have that test case, we can also execute the test case against the application, which is now shown on the right-hand side. Now, if it's a web application, then as we all know, um, if, if, if you actually look under the hood, then you will see that there is actually HTML underneath that uh, represents this application. Now, why do I bring that up? If it's actually a web service, 
it would look very, very similar. So there's not much difference to uh, to the web service that would actually lead to exactly the same the same result. So in Tosca or in, in model-based test automation, you actually can use exactly the same test case to run against API or 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 UI test. There is no differentiation because of the clear separation of con the concern. The only difference is how you actually read it. it. Looks exactly the same on the left and the right hand side. The only difference is you might end up with different automation models. You might have an automation model for the web service, and you might have an automation model for the UI interface. Now, very quickly, a, a quick um, comparison between model-based and script-based. Um, um, model-based takes automatically care of your synchronization. It includes recovery handling. It includes data-driven for reuse. And it's also a keyword-driven framework that comes out of the box. And that's the reason why it's probably the most advanced um, framework that is uh, on the market these days. The reason why it's called model-based is because we built a model of the interfaces of the system on the test, and that's the reason why we call them automation models. Um, just to open a bracket in comparison to MBT, model-based testing, you might have heard about that. Model-based testing more deals with um, uh, using graphical models such as use, use case diagram that will ha and flow charts that will help you to derive the scope of the testing in the first place. So MBT is complementary to MBTA, model-based test automation. Now what also model-based test automation does, it actually works across um, more than 120 different technologies. Um, so that you can run end-to-end -end business process test uh, against almost every interface. Um, now, uh, model-based test automation, I think that's a very important point here. Model-based test automation is script-free, but not code-free. Let me, let me, let me uh, point it out. That's a very important point. Script-free means, because of this clear separation of concern between the business logic and the automation logic and the automation models that are generated on the mouse click for API or UI, and there is no script anymore. Your test cases are, are, are described in a business-like language, even in the BDD-like language, uh, given when then whatever you want to choose. So from that perspective, it's totally script-free, and that's one of the reasons why it scales so nicely across any core application, and you achieve much, much higher automation levels. However, it is not code-free. And why is it not code-free? Um, and that applies to open source or commercial vendors. We can only um, support out-of-the-box automation, what is openly available to us. I'll give you an example. If Microsoft Visual Studio releases a new set of WPF controls, we can access these controls and we can provide out-of-the-box support. But as soon as you have an object-oriented language, language, either um, .NET or Java, as you know, you can inherit from a standard control and build all sorts of additional behavior on top of that control. Now, no automation tool will work out of the box because it's proprietary to that organization, to that developer that actually created it. The same is true, actually, when you have um, web applications, although there you can't really inherit because HTML is a more descriptive language. What you will find in there are so-called composite controls where you um, combine different uh, basic controls and link them together with JavaScript uh, in order to provide a dynamic um, behavior. And this is where um, a lot of um, or most automation tools actually struggle out of the box. Um, Model-based test automation or Tosca behind it is actually an open framework as an API and that allows you to programmatically extend the engines for situations where um, the automation does not work out of the box so that you can provide true support. And I think this is a very, very important aspect here. Good.
Um, let me come to the summary of uh, today's uh, webinar. I, I hope um, you know this gave you some some insights about our experience and and and, and also the business case for having actually a, a much more robust and, and scalable test automation framework in place. And maybe very quickly on present is only two slides. Um, we are. Um, the leading organization when it comes down to continuous testing and we build a continuous testing platform. We come actually from the test automation space, but over the past uh, two years we have completed um, our continuous testing platform in terms of um, we have added service virtualization, test-driven service virtualization to it. We have also um, added browser-based load testing that's in the automation space. And from an optimization perspective, we have a, a very strong uh, solution in the agile test management space. We also do MBT, model-based testing, as I quickly mentioned uh, when I compared model-based testing against model-based test automation. Yeah. It's about portfolio, right, and then uh, exploratory testing. And um, I think the main difference that we can bring to the to 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 the table is really it's not only just a 10 or 20 percent improve that you can achieve with that testing platform we have proven with many organizations that we literally can increase the efficiency or the effectiveness by a factor of 10 in comparison to uh, traditional test automation approaches. And it is not only confirmed by many, many customers um, around the globe, this is also confirmed by the leading analysts like Forrester Gartner and IDC who rate Tricentis um, as the most innovative company in that space uh, and also in um, and put them in the leaders quadrant in all of these areas. And what they say is uh, you know model-based test automation or Tosca should be considered by enterprises that have struggled to make test automation work, and by those seeking to support agile continuous automation practices. And with that, um, I think I'm at the end, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, a wonderful insight on model-based test automation. Uh, friends, those who have joined late, uh, we are having this one-to-one -one, uh, webinar conversation with Mr. Thomas Haddon. Uh, you can see his contact details on, the, on your screen. Um, if you have any questions, you can write to me. Thomas, I have a question uh, from the participant. Uh, they are saying that you know, before we dive into model-based test, you know, uh, head-on, uh, significant investment is needed in the infrastructure. So, uh, you know, they want to understand what what are the initial hiccups when they go into model-based test automation, and do you recommend that uh, a company should who has no experience in test automation should adopt it, or they need to have some prior experience in you know uh, simpler test automation before going into model-based test automation and investing in the infrastructure? It is a very good question. I think where with model-based test automation, um, to be fair and just, if you don't implement the best practices, you might end up with the same maintenance uh, nightmare like with other uh, tools. I'll give you an example. When you create automation models, you usually have exactly one model at um, when we have a UI test per screen or you modelize it, um, you have several automation models, but only one for one part of the screen. But if you're not careful um, and you don't manage that carefully, you might actually end up with 10 modules, automation models, that actually cover the same part. So you end up with interface catalogs that are redundant. And if you now have a change, then what happened is that you have additional maintenance effort. And as I mentioned before, maintenance is the number one killer for test automation. So, so we have um, best practices that we are more than happy to share. How do we actually come up with, um, with the best approach to avoid that? Secondly, what we have also observed is 
and this comes more for when you have an experienced scripter they often don't really understand the clear se the object orientation and clear separation of concern so what what they try to do when you have a test case they try to implement technical logic in the test case and vice versa on the automation level so you actually diluting and blurring the clear separation of concern which is a main aspect to reduce maintenance so again um, that's another aspect where you need to be careful about uh, to really stick to the rules what should go in a test case and what should go into an automation model but again um, that's easily solvable by applying the best practices okay great um Thomas, um, the question is, uh, you know, if if somebody has good has reasonable experience in model based testing, does that automatically qualify uh, him or her to, uh, you know, start working on model based test automation suites? Uh, 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 absolutely, uh, I think this. I think the, the strength of model-based test automation, which is it's just a very advanced test automation framework. So don't, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong here. Yeah. Uh, the name model-based test automation was given to us by Gartner when they put us in the Gartner Cool Vendor Report. They said, actually, what we actually do is a, is a model-driven approach to test automation by building these automation models. What it really does, it makes actually um, – a manual test much, lies much easier because you don't need to script anymore to generate the test assets. So a non-technical tester is capable to come up with an automated test case without any programming. That I mean, the team still, and then I mentioned that before, with, you know, it's script-free but not code-free. It still might re require, you know, one or two test automation engineers that have programming skills that know how to extend the, the framework programmatically. But you don't need that skills for generating the keywords, for example, right? So that's the reason why it scales much better. So I think it's a key enabler for high automation to leverage um, uh, on experienced people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we have time for one last question. Uh, so those who have uh, joined late, uh, the uh, good news is that we have we are recording this webinar and we'll be sharing uh, this webinar with you uh, within a week after this uh, as soon as the tech team gives hands it over to us. So the last question, Thomas, uh, uh, for us is that what is the downside of uh, model-based test automation? Like when has there been any scenarios where you would have recommended them not to go with it for whatever reason? What? What's the challenges and when, when is it possible? Well, model-based test automation is a black box testing tool and not a white box testing tool. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about unit testing on a white box level, which is very important, particularly when you go down the shift to the left, I think uh, model-based test automation is the wrong approach because uh, you really need to write code insertion and, and, and build the test automation into the code. And there are um, fantastic um, solutions on the market. When it really comes down to black box test automation, I think model-based test automation is the only approach that really supports scalability. As I mentioned, model-based test is just a very, very, very advanced test automation framework that automates the automation framework. So it's, it's a next maturity level that is available and that addresses some of the shortfalls of the other frameworks. Great. Thanks, Thomas. And uh, this brings uh, an end to this webinar. Uh, thank you very much once again, Thomas, for taking off, taking time for us and uh, helping the community in uh, Australia and New Zealand to uh, uh, get a better understanding of uh, model-based test automation. Uh, I also thank all the participants who have joined and taken time. We would be very happy to receive any feedback from you. And also, if you intend to have any uh, focus, any other webinar uh, you know, on any topic, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We will definitely try to arrange uh, 
and uh, we'd, we would be working closely with Thomas uh, to uh, organize a similar webinar very soon. Uh, on that note, we thank Thomas, and uh, let me tell you that Thomas has taken this webinar from the airport, and he's, uh, he's in transit, so I'm really uh, very uh, thankful to Thomas once again for, uh, uh, for this wonderful session. Thank you, Nitesh. Um, thank you for having me. Yes. So thanks. So, so ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Mr. Thomas Hadon, uh, Managing Director at Trust Tricentis, and this was a session on model-based test automation. As you know, um, you automatically qualify for 25% discount on any of the published event. We have the forthcoming test automation summits happening in Europe, India, and America. So make full use of this, and hopefully we'll have you in our next webinar, conferences, trainings very soon. Thank you so much, and have a nice and pleasant evening. Thank you.